it up the other day. It's like 43,000 days or 47,000 days ago. Uh, I was figuring it out last night. My wife applied to go to Biola and the Wheaton, and they lost her application. I'm so glad because I met her at Wheaton College. Uh, so um, it's, it's no reflection on you all, all right? But uh, I was just glad to meet her about 40 years ago. And uh, she's a better Christian than I am. So um, I'm going to tell you a story about her in just a moment. But I wanted to start with a scripture passage. Uh, that has to do with anger. And um, it, it's, uh, just listen to this. Uh, don't turn to it, just listen to this word from God. But uh, in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, James says, You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness, right growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness, the implanted word that has power to save your souls. That's, uh, that, that's a good word for us, and I want you to keep a couple things in mind. Be slow to anger, and also this idea of um, uh, just uh, spending some time. Um, well, we're going to talk about it, patience. So my wife, several years ago, she was in the grocery store, and... Um, this fellow who was in line right in front of her, being waited on by the checker, um, looks over at a woman, the next uh, checker over, and says, hey, stubby, get over here and do your job to bag his groceries. So my wife, as I told you, a better Christian than I am, I mean, I'm sitting on the plane sometimes, and she's praying with the person next to me. I don't guess, but anyway. <laughs> my wife was stunned, and so um, she, she was so startled, she didn't know what to, to do. So she says to this guy, oh, um, were you joking, or were you actually talking to another human being that way? Um, and he told her this wasn't any of her business. And, and so she replied that it wasn't right to talk to somebody that way. And uh, his response, uh, didn't match his chronological age, uh, used uh, some lines that you would hear on a child's playground. Um, and then and then ended with this, uh, I hate to be your husband and wake up and see your face every morning. Which uh, shows us that he not only lacked emotional maturity, but he also had poor aesthetic judgment. Uh, but, uh, you really did. Just, um, uh, anyway, but my, my wife just answered calmly and, um, and said, I feel sorry for you. Uh, it's very sad. Now, the question is, should my wife have just blown up at this guy and gotten really angry for, for what he said? And, and that leads to another question. Is there any place for anger in the Christian's life? <clears throat> And so I titled this Good News About Anger because I wanted to be ironic. I don't think there is much good news about anger in the Christian life. Um, I've been listening to a lot of guys who lived 1,500, 1,400 years ago. They're actually in my Bible study group. Um, just because people are dead doesn't mean they don't get a voice in your Bible study group, all right? So we listen to them and we read. Now they, we can talk back to them and they can't talk back to us. That's a nice thing. But um, I'm with these guys, you might call monks, and um, the guy named Evagrius, Cassian, uh, Gregory the Great, uh, and then much, much later, uh, we let Ansel in, because uh, he was actually bouncing off of these guys. So I've learned a lot about issues like anger and the other, what we call deadly sins. And what I want to share with you this morning is going to have a lot to do with what they have shared with me. And so I have to give them a big footnote. Now, they, they learned a lot of this stuff because they were using scripture and trying to live it out in community. And they really came up with what you might call a Christian psychology. It's, it's an authentic Christian psychology. They didn't take secular ideas and then baptize them with Christian jargon and, and proof texting. They actually began with their Christian understanding of life and then observed how life got along in this community they lived in and, and came out with an authentic. By the way, the word authentic means original. So this is an original Christian psychology in that sense. So these guys are in my Bible study group, and so I'll be, I'll be working off of them. And it, it's an important issue, this issue of anger. Um, it's important, um, it, you probably, some of you already got angry today. I caught myself um, on the 55 today, yes. The guy in front of me. Yeah, the LA freeways are a good example of this. I said, God, I'm going to talk about anger, and I just blew it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then uh, we saw it with a giant Dodger game. Okay. Uh, Dodger Stadium, 
Uh, anger can be deadly in that sense. It almost became deadly. Uh, it does become deadly in, in an international sense. I mean, Iran, uh, places like that, people get angry about uh, what's going on there. Uh, and, and of course, yes, uh, some people get angry about um, A.P. losing to Viola two nights ago. But uh, it's a dangerous emotion, and it, it, it floods our lives uh, from both uh, trivial ideas to um, international issues. Well, before we get to anger itself, let me just talk a little bit about these deadly sins, what are called deadly sins. Uh, they actually started with a list of eight. So a couple of guys in my Bible study group, like Pete Baggers and Cashin, had a list of eight. And then Gregory the Great comes along in the sixth century, and he, he, he messes around with the list, and he comes up with the list we've got today of seven. And, um, and they're really chief sins, cardinal sins, capital sins. And, and that word means that they give birth to other sins. So these are kind of at the head of the list. And if you've got one of these, then, and by the way, every one of us throughout our entire lives will be affected by every one of these sins. Some more than others. Uh, that is to say, there are some on the list that will affect you uh, more than somebody else, and then that person is going to be affected more by uh, some others on the list. But in any case, these chief sins, these cardinal sins, can become deadly. And they become deadly when they become habitual. For instance, if anger becomes habitual, it might manifest itself in something like racism. <laughs> And a racist attitude, a deeply racist attitude, is deadly. And so that's why they're called deadly sins. They can actually, uh, they can actually kill us, but more than that, they kill the grace of God flowing through our lives. And we're going to need a spiritual angioplasty to open up those, those spiritual arteries so the grace of God can flow through. But when these sins, these chief sins, get in there and clog up those spiritual arteries, God's grace can't flow through to change us. So that's why they're called deadly. Now, these guys in my Bible study, they, um, they, they, they saw that a lot of times these pair up, like gluttony and lust. Think of Carl's Jr. ads. <laughs> Actually, boycott them. I don't, I've never eaten there because, um, um, because of the way that they portray women and men. Men can't break breakfast, they can't break an egg. And women uh, are, are, are treated uh, as sex objects. But they got it. Madison Avenue knows this, that you can take food and lust, put them together. But these guys knew that 1,500 years ago. And they saw these kind of combinations that gang up on us, and very insightful. They come oftentimes in these pairs. They said gluttony and lust are the first ones, uh, because um, they involve our embodied existence. And they said if you can't deal with gluttony and lust, how are you ever going to deal with envy and anger and, 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 and sloth and pride? if you can't get in a handle on your embodied existence. And they thought of gluttony and lust like the qualifying heats, you get ready for the Parthian or Olympic Games. But first you gotta qualify by dealing with the first couple on the list. So, um, so they had a lot of good insights about this kind of thing and, um, and, and, and we're the recipients of this. They, they deconstructed anger a little bit. It's, a, it's the most predominant of the deadly sins. In fact, I found some verification of that. I've been looking at contemporary psychological literature, and I've been finding out that what we think we've discovered in psychology, these guys already knew a long time ago. And one of the guys who's a psychiatrist, a guy named Solomon Schimmel, looked back at some of these ancient sources and compared them to his practice as a psychiatrist. And he said that, and this is, a, uh, th this is his observation, he said that uh, of all the deadly sins, Anger is the one that he encounters as an emotion most in his practice. He has to deal with that with people in his practice. Now, uh, as these guys were thinking about uh, this really harmful um, uh, anger, they, they classified it in different ways. I want you to think about this. Uh, because Proverbs 12, 16 says, Fools show their anger at once, but the prudent ignore an insult. Fools show their anger at once, Proverbs 12, 16. And, and what these guys recognized was, you know, there are different kinds of anger. They didn't like any of it, but they said the, the least dangerous anger is the anger that arises slowly and then drops off. In other words, it's something you've thought about a little bit, you know, and you've, uh, yeah, it's, okay, okay, yeah, I should get angry about that. <laughs> and then, then I got to get rid of it. 
The worst anger, they said, is the anger that comes on very quickly and then drops off very slowly. In other words, you stew in it. It's, it's just that emotional response right away, and you stew in that anger. And so that goes along with what Proverbs says, that the fool shows his anger at once. Now, they said a lot of times, this anger comes from greed. Remember, they paired these up. And they said a lot of times, anger is paired up with greed. Think about this. That greed is all about wanting to possess, wanting to control. And, and, and if our wanting to control or wanting to possess is thwarted, we get angry. I can't have it. I don't. I want it. Um, one time when I was uh, when I was teaching at Wheaton College, I taught at Wheaton for about 14 years, and then my wife brought me to Southern California. And because she's a better Christian than I am, I did follow her. Anyway, um, but uh, when I was at Wheaton, we had a program called Wheaton in the Holy Lands. Uh, in fact, some of you have taken it class from Eric Tonneson when he was a student. He and Donna went with us, uh, and we were the cross. We went a couple of times, and then I wanted to go a third time with my closest colleague and friend. And the word came back that day, you can't go because uh, you've gone too many times already. We want somebody else to go. I was so, I was so ticked off. I went out and ran four miles. But I was so angry. Why? Because I couldn't possess that opportunity to go to Wheaton in the Holy Lands a third time. And, and so a lot of times, think about that with your anger. A lot of times, because you want to possess or control and it's thwarted, you get angry. And then, because of that, it can lead to a, a kind of depression they call sloth. And Todd's going to talk about that in a, in a few days. Um, a kind of a depression. I think about this in my attempt to play tennis. When I was a kid, a little kid, my dad tried to teach me tennis, all right? So we'd go to the tennis court at the high, local high school. And uh, he'd hit the ball to me, and I would hit the ball somewhere else. <laughs> I'd hit it in the net, or I'd go sailing over the, the court fence, you know. And I would just get so mad. I would get angry because I couldn't possess the skill of playing tennis. And then finally, after my father tried to teach me a few times, uh, uh, actually I was trying to learn how to take a <coughs> lesson from John McEnroe, you know, because he would, if you know tennis, he, he would get angry in the court. But he got angry as a good tennis player. I was getting angry because I couldn't possess this skill. So I finally gave up. And so that's kind of a sloth. I mean, my greed led to my anger, led to my giving up. And so they see this kind of a, 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 and you might think about that in your own life. Do you see some of those patterns in your life? And we'll talk a little bit about how to deal with those in a minute. But I want to deal with a question before we get to some practical how to deal with it. Is it okay to be angry? Cashin said no, never, ever. He, he looks at Ephesians 4.31, and Ephesians 4.31 says, Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger, and wrangling, and slander together with all malice. Notice the verse doesn't say, put away from you most anger and wrath. Put away from all of it. And so he says, you should never get angry. But then somebody, you might come back and say, but God gets angry. I mean, I just read Psalm 106, 40 this morning in my daily uh, office, and it says, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. And Jesus got angry at the, at the, at the money sell, the money changers. But then Cashin comes back and he says, yeah, but we just remember, you are God. That's a good thing to remember. I am not God, and God is not me. In other words, Cashin said, uh, you know, there's a difference between God's anger and my anger. And not only that, but Cashin said, what happens is usually when I get angry, I try to rationalize it. I always rationalize it. In fact, it was very interesting. Even 1,500 years ago, they looked at Matthew 5.22, where Jesus says, do not be angry. And that's what the original text said. But even 1,500 years ago, they knew about textual criticism, and they found out that uh, you know, some uh, later texts added the phrase without cause. Do not be angry without cause. And if you look in the King James Version today, it'll still have the verse that way. But if you look in the newer translations, 
that have worked with better manuscripts and older manuscripts, it'll simply say, be not, don't be angry. And then in the footnotes, some manuscripts add without cause. And Cashin says, of course, who's going to say, I'm really angry? I don't have any reason to be angry, but I'm really angry. <laughs> of course, we, we always justify it. We always rationalize it. Always. I'm angry. You know, this stupid jar won't live more open. <laughs> Which is a stupid rationality, but that's, well, we, we, well, even if it's something inanimate, we rationalize our anger. And so Cash is very cautious. But then you might come back, you might say, well, did you look at Ephesians 4.26? Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. I mean, it says, be angry, but do not sin. So Cash and Gregory, two guys in my Bible study, they, they kind of got an argument about this one. Cash said, well, I can deal with that, I can interpret that in my own way. And Gregory said, well, wait a minute. It does say you could get angry sometimes. But here's what both of those guys in my Bible study agree on. They agree that it's really hard to be angry and not sin. It's really hard to be angry and not sin. And the reason that they said that was, and this is the primary reason why they objected to getting angry at all, is it interferes with our discernment. It interferes with our judgment, our good judgment. I mean, all you have to do is drive on the LA freeway to see that, right? Road rage. I mean, it's stupid, right? But people get angry, and it interferes with their good judgment. And sometimes they then make decisions in haste, in anger, that will be life-changing for themselves and for other people on the road. And so they're very concerned that we don't be blinded by anger. And so they were very conservative. Don't get angry. And then they said, you know, one other thing, it interferes with our prayer life. It interferes with our prayer life. First Timothy 2.8. 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I desire then that in every place the people should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Matthew 5, 23, 24, Jesus says, if, you, if your brother's got something against you, don't go up to the altar and pray and worship me first. First go reconcile with your, with your brother or sister, and then, and then come and pray and worship. It's difficult to pray while you're hanging on to some bitterness. It's difficult to pray if you've got some resentment in your life. Uh, when I was at a monastery one time, Brother Gene, crusty guy, uh, ex-Marine, uh, long white beard, we, we were in prayer that morning and we chanted uh, the psalm, the imprecatory psalm, dash their children's heads on the rocks. <laughs> Not a great way to start your morning, you know what I mean? Uh, and so Brother Gene came up to me afterwards and he said, Is it bother you to say that in prayer? And I said, yeah, it did. It does me too, he said. But then I think of everybody in the world this morning who feels that way because they've been treated unjustly and I, I stop and pray for them. But you see what he did? He had to dissociate the anger from the prayer. He couldn't enter into that prayer itself and dissociate from it and then pray for people who did feel that kind of anger this morning. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his wonderful book, Life Together, if you've never read Life Together, read that book, get it right away, just uh, skip classes today and read the book. Anyway. But in Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, said, you cannot hate, you can no longer hate a brother or sister for whom you pray. You can no longer hate a brother or sister for whom you pray. Try it. So anger interferes with our prayer life. It interferes with our good judgment. How are we going to deal with this anger? Well, there's always a countervailing virtue for all of these sins. In other words, if, if you're dealing with one of these sins, you need to cultivate some sort of character, characteristic or some sort of virtue in your life. And for this one, it's patience. Patience. Um, they said, don't vent. Don't vent your anger. That'll just make it increase. And by the way, modern psychology says the same thing. And don't suppress it. Don't stew in it. But develop some patience. And what patience is, that even the Greek word in the New Testament has this image. 
Patience is a widening of the heart. You know, if you take a, a, water, a very small water pipe and push water through it, uh, but then uh, you, it comes to, to another pipe that's larger, you know what will happen. It'll, it'll just shoot through the small pipe. But if you have a larger pipe, the water goes more slowly and doesn't have the same force. And that's the idea. If you could widen your heart, that would be the kind of patience you need. You widen your heart, for instance, with memory. Memory of what? Of God's forgiveness of you. Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. God is so patient. You know, I just read a definition of unbelievers last week. Uh, unbelievers are people who take advantage of the patience of God with regard to their sin. God is so patient. Remember how patient he's been with you? How he's forgiven you? Patience while you're waiting for that anger to arise, just stop and be patient. Why in the heart with memory of God's grace to you? And then hope. You, the patience also is supposed to have this hope. And the, these guys in my Bible study said, yeah, hope of what? Hope of reconciliation in the future. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can come together on this. Maybe this will turn out okay. Maybe it won't, but maybe my life will be better for it. And so we do that. Contemporary psychology is called this sometimes reframing. Uh, or, um, or cognitive reappraisal. What? To reinterpret the event. In other words, if some guy cuts you off on the freeway, don't just say, what a jerk. Maybe be patient, widen the heart, and say, I don't know. Maybe this guy just found out his, his wife or his child was in the hospital. And that's what his thoughts are. I don't know. I want to widen my heart. I want to be patient. Um, that's what my wife did with that guy in the line. She tried to understand what he was doing, what he was saying. Are you joking, or are you talking to another human being that way? That's because, again, my wife's a better Christian. She would know how to do that. I wouldn't, all right? But she just knew that without even getting into my Bible study with these guys. She knew that what you have to do is be patient, widen the heart for a minute, reframe the situation. Possibly this guy just has a bad sense of humor. Maybe he even has a bad day. So we do that with memory and hope. Let me just suggest to you a few more practices as we finish today that might help you that I've learned from these guys. They've learned it, again, applying scripture in their community. They said, for one thing, if, if anger a lot of times comes from greed, well then, get rid of your greed. Quit worrying about all of your possessions. I mean, uh, I had a psychologist friend uh, living next door to us in Illinois, and he said one day to me, you know, sometimes when I'm on the, on the highway, and a guy cuts me out, he said, he took my space, and then I remembered, well, that wasn't my space to begin with. <laughs> I mean, quit possessing. Quit wanting to control. And then maybe your anger will be dealt with. And then another practice they said is, is recall your own offenses. Recall what you've done and how people have responded or how God has responded. One time our son called from camp in, when I was in high school. Hey, Dad, I just lost my glasses. How'd you lose your glasses? Well, they, uh, we were sleeping on the dock, and, and I rolled over my sleeping bag, and they fell off into the lake. Would have been a good idea to put the glasses inside the sleeping bag? Oh, yeah, that might have been a good idea, yeah. But I, before I got angry, I remembered the time that I went down the Sacramento River Rapids with my glasses on. <laughs> and my parents were really nice about it and bought me another pair so I could see. I got my eyes laser, by the way, so uh, I used to be able not to see anything. And that was nice of my parents, wasn't it? So, so uh, I did the same thing to ourselves. Or the time that he nicked a Cadillac with our minivan in a parking lot. And, uh, you know, I, when I got home, I, he's trying to get the, the dent out of our car with his friends so I wouldn't know. <laughs> and, and then I remember the time that I backed my mom's little car into my dad's, a big car in the driveway, and I didn't get angry. Remember your offenses and how you've been forgiven and how others have treated you, even when you didn't deserve it. And then another, another tactic. Use an opposite 
ploy. In other words, use an opposite behavior. And this works with a lot of the deadly sins. For instance, on, 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 on envy. I mean, envy is huge with academic profs, right? Somebody publishes a book, dang, I don't know anything about that subject, but I wish I had that book. I'm going to write, uh, you know, Vita. Dang. So I did that with my son one time. He loved Emily Dickinson's poetry, and my colleague published a book on Emily Dickinson that week, and uh, uh, I don't know anything about it, really. I was angry that his book was a success. And so I went to the bookstore, and I bought it, and I had him sign it to my son. Because what you have to do is do something, do something that is opposite of the sin. So for anger, if anger arises from greed, give something away. Or, or sing a praise song. It's really hard to sing a praise song to God and hold the anger inside against someone or something. Or run four miles. And, uh, and now thank God for the opportunity that he gave you just now to develop patience. So use an opposite behavior. And then one other tip off here. They said, prepare. Prepare. In other words, monitor your past episodes of anger. When was the last time you got angry? How, how do you get angry most often? For me, it, it often is on the freeway. So when I get in the car, I just have to think, Aqua, you're going to now get on the LA freeway. There will be people who will get in your way. There will be people who drive slow in the fast lane because they're on the cell phone. You need to remember this, and I just kind of mentally put a little phrase on my dashboard, a mental phrase, uh, unconquerable benevolence, that my good wishes for others will not be conquered on the freeway. And then I have to monitor. In other words, have really good self-knowledge about yourself. Become an expert on your own anger. Become an expert on your blood triggers. And then, and then this, keep a perspective on the end. What matters most in your life? These monks always said that. They always said, remember that someday you will die. From ashes you came to ashes you'll go. And remember someday that God will bring all to a conclusion. And that the little things that you're angry about now will be small in comparison. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us, that God is patient, and that God wishes all to be saved, and that our anger does not accomplish His righteousness. Our anger does not accomplish God's justice. He is in charge. He will get the work done. And these guys in my Bible study are constantly reminding me of that. I want to pray for us uh, now as we close, but I want you to remember this too. That my guys in my Bible study always know that underneath all of these good suggestions, there's God's grace. That without God's grace working in our lives, that in those arteries, that none of this is going to be possible. And so we need to keep those spiritual arteries clean. And, uh, and if you need an angio spiritual angioplasty, use some of these tactics that they've come up with and get rid of that anger so that God's patience can flow through you. Um, God's so patient, he waited in the womb of Mary for nine months. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're patient with us. It blows our minds away. How could you be patient with us? Because every day, we let you down. Every day, we come back to you and ask for your forgiveness again. And every day, every day, every moment, you come back to us and say, I love you. And there's nothing that you can do that will make me love you less and nothing you can do that will make you love me more. That make me love you more. So we thank you for your patience for us. Would you instill it in our lives through your Holy Spirit so that we can go through this day, even this day, and not let anger control us, but know that the good news is that you wait for us and you want all to be saved and that you're doing that salvation work in our lives right now. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.